And all right, lights, camera, action. Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to the latest episode in the Rhode Island New Technology, Boston New Technology, all the new technologies Fireside Friday series. We have a very special guest with us today to you know close out the month of September right on the heels of Rhode Island Startup Week. There's so much to be excited about. We have Tuni Shartner. Uh, so before we get underway, Tuni, just want to uh, make folks familiar with the connection that we share. We were just talking about it. So everybody, when I was first getting started in the uh, entrepreneurial community, innovation space, Tuni was one of those people who pulled out a chair for me, opened a door for me and said, you know, sit down and make yourself at home. She's extremely hospitable and extremely inventive and imaginative. And she's got a very big passion for supporting new entrepreneurship, small businesses, all the things we love to see that help power the economy, but also empower others. So with that, Tuni, take us away with your introduction. Hi. Uh, so my introduction is always interesting, right? Because I yeah. <laughs> kind of wear a lot of hats. I call myself Rhode Island's economic gardener because over a decade ago, um, as a single mom, I kind of did a pivot and decided to focus my attention um, on giving whatever um, tools, talents, and skills I had to help grow the Rhode Island economy. So um, that was soon after that, Gina Raimondo, you know, had her first term as governor. And um, there were a whole bunch of us that uh, have been working together to get to where we are now in the Rhode Island economy. And um, it's pretty exciting. So I, um, I am a serial entrepreneur. I've owned two landscape companies. Uh, one was a cash mowing business in college. And then the other one I designed, installed, and maintained beautiful, high-performing, low-maintenance landscapes. Um, I've owned uh, a restaurant and two coffee houses, a uh, bakery. I used to make wedding cakes and deliver them. Um, I grew up in an, in an entrepreneurial family. And at the age of 55, we didn't talk about entrepreneurship. When I was growing up, like all my friends' parents worked at like IBM and mom stayed home or, you know, that was the beginning of women really becoming more professional. So I grew up with small business owners as parents and a lot of their friends were because I grew up in the horse world. And, um, and I have been helping Rhode Island businesses grow for decades, whether I did it as a consulting practice specific to focus on that or whether I was just helping fellow Chamber of Commerce members um, design their growth strategies and marketing plans and pulling other experts in to assist them. So that's something that's just always come naturally to me. And um, so I currently have Tooney Shartner Consulting LLC, and my passion project is the Hive RI, which I think we'll talk about more later. It's a co-working space and the nucleus of an 85,000 square foot historic mill complex uh, business community with over 100 tenants. And um, I've served a couple tours of duty under the Raimondo administration as executive director for um, Innovate Newport, um, which we can talk about later, and uh, then for District Hall Providence and Venture Cafe Providence, and, um, and part of the senior leadership team for the regional nonprofit innovation studio. So um, I, I'll stop there, Steve, because we have a lot to talk about. We do. We do have a lot <laughs> to talk about. But I mean, suffice it to say, you've had quite the journey, you know, in this ecosystem. And in many ways, you've helped to, you know, speaking of, I'm going to make all of the gardening puns, I'm sure, while we're, while we're doing this. So you've planted plenty of seeds, and then you've also helped to harvest a lot of uh, very, you know, successful and exciting, you know, businesses and a lot of growth. Just there's been a lot of growth. Uh, so let's see. I mean, like you said, we do have a lot to get into. I really appreciated the origin story. So let's start with something fun. I mean, Right here and now in the present moment, what would you say are some of the things you're most excited about that you're involved in? And then if you wouldn't mind also just sort of giving us like your own perspective on what you're also seeing, again, in these contemporary times when it comes to new uh, entrepreneurship and new innovation. Okay, I was, I was thinking about this um, in preparation. So as far as the Rhode Island economy, um, super excited. Like right now, Molly Williams, the director of, who I adore, is the director of Innovate Newport. I only signed up for the first two legs of the relay. They needed a very scrappy entrepreneurial um, an inaugural executive director to get Innovate Newport open. Just a, a little background. Um, 
Innovate Newport was the Sheffield School. It's a hundred year old historic brick elementary school in the city of Newport. Um, that started off a two and a half million dollar two year public private partnership project. Eight years later, we needed to get it open at eight million dollars. So I was the inaugural director, served. Um, I I signed up for eighteen months, give or take a couple months, to get it open, and um, and build the initial community and culture. So for the first ten months, it was getting it open. It was Tooney wearing a hard hat, giving six hundred hard hat tours, working with the contractors, and then. Um, Jordan, who you probably know, who's still at Innovation Studio, um, was my intern that helped me open Innovate Newport. So we were very um, lacking in resources, let's say, and they needed someone very entrepreneurial. So we got that open. And I'm circling around because right now it's on probably the seventh or eighth leg of the relay. And Molly Williams is an amazing um, colleague and friend, and she's the director there. She partnered with Riley Kahn's from um, Venture Cafe Providence, and they are doing... They're kicking off Rhode Island Startup Week as we're speaking, taking a whole bunch of people on an innovation tour on a bus around Rhode Island. So that's exciting. The, the fact that it continues to grow and evolve and there's a there there now, as my friend Bob Ruley says, um, we've created a there there that continues. Uh, I credit Gina Raimondo, who's now our Secretary of Commerce with I call her time as governor is the great time of the great convergence because for decades, so many of us were trying to work together to support each other, to grow the economy. And I really literally saw her come in and move internal resources around, bring external resources in that we needed to build out. And um, she really built the infrastructure and developed the strategy to get us going. And now it's our job to continue to strengthen that foundation and grow the economy, the innovation economy. Um, hi, Michael. Um, sorry. And uh, so I'm excited about that. I'm excited and I'm still part of it, but more in a supportive way. I love to build things and I love to support and nurture growth. Um, so from planting seeds to harvesting to continuing to nurturing crops, I guess you could say that I'm excited about that. But I'm also excited about a project I'm working on and I haven't been this excited in a long time. Uh, I, My friend who lives in Rhode Island, who was running the Office of Community and Economic Development for the town of Warren, Rhode Island, was tapped by the town of Bridgewater, Massachusetts um, to come lead a very robust revitalization economic development strategy. And um, he pulled me in, I think in his third month there, and we've got a lot of exciting stuff happening in Bridgewater, Mass. Um, so those are the two things that are exciting me right now. Excellent. And, you know, I mean, there's so much to, to look at there. I mean, one of the things that really stands out to me both about you and also the state of Rhode Island is there is this very like hands-on, very like ingenuity, like, you know, very ingenious, but also like adaptable way of doing things where everybody basically like pitches in and does, you know, what that's, that's classic to me. That is classic entrepreneurship. Also, I do know Jordan. Jordan is uh, doing amazing things around New England in general, but also like, you know, when it comes to Riley and, you know, the innovation tour like i remember speaking about that with him a couple of months ago we we're hoping to get some entrepreneurs from austria to come by and actually hop on the bus but unfortunately there was like a, a little situation there um but yeah i mean there there is so much going on in community yeah community is absolutely where it's at i also love when you talked about the time of the great convergence because i feel like at certain points along the way you know the innovation tipping point but also when you have these new generations of entrepreneurs and entrepreneurship, like it's a very, very, like, it's a very privileged uh, opportunity that we have, in my opinion, like conveners to, you know, be a part of it and also witness like all that growth. So my next, my next question is, I love this. this is yeah. Cool. My next question, you're, you're really going to love this, this question. I want you to talk to me and talk specifically to why you Tooney feel that small business itself, I know this is kind of broad, but I know you'll have fun with it. Why you feel that small business is so like absolutely imperative in life, society, you know, how, how things are, how we improve. Well, this is easy. Um, so first and foremost, I believe in the importance of community. Um, I'm very committed. I think the real pandemic in our culture in America, especially, uh, is mental health. And I think, um, we have a lot of isolation and um, I naturally, I've had a lot of people say, you're so European in the way you think. And 
I believe in community. You know, I believe in the importance of community, whether we're talking about the innovation economy community, right? Riley and Molly and like being a part of that. Um, but small business is the backbone of strong communities, right? And, you know, the in innovation economy is critical, but we have to build communities that people in to, that are, we're trying to attract to build the innovation economy, want to come and live and grow families and have, you know, a sense of place and small business plays such a critical role in that. And, um, you know, when I got tapped to, to lead district hall venture cafe Providence, I remember saying to Kevin Wyant, I said, you know, one of my main concerns is that I'm a huge champion for small business in Rhode Island where Rhode Island is a huge small business state, like 98% of our business is small business. And I said, we can't afford to lose any of us because there aren't that many really strong small business champions. So, you know, I, I'm one of the founding mentors with VMS venture mentoring service that we brought here from MIT. Six of us went to MIT in for a week in January of 2018 to learn. Um, then we came in February of 2018 and stood up the Rhode Island VMS program. And then when Rye Hub, the state's first innovation campus, which uh, Annette Tanti is running, uh, which is a partnership between the state, URI, Brown, and IBM um, that, that is headquartered in 225 Dyer and C CIC Providence. Um, when, when Annette stood that up, then we merged the VMS program under that. I'm a huge uh, proponent and I'm still involved in and supporting the innovation economy, but we, you know, it's all integrated, right? And small business community needs support. And I say this with no judgment, um, that most people who get into small business don't have any business training. Right. And, um, and I love, you know, what excites me is to meet a small business owner where they're at, learn how they like to communicate because we all send and receive information differently and help them think more strategically about their business and learn how to work on their business to grow their business instead of just in, um, in and for their business. And I apologize for the snores. That's Homer. Um, I get a lot of laughs in my, in my office. He brings levity to a lot of very serious business conversations. Well, so, so that's my answer. I think, I don't know if I answered your question, but. And you also um, opened up another insight. So first of all, I, I definitely agree with you that there is this in always has been like this interconnectedness with all the different, you know, moving parts and pieces, which you agree with and actually depend very heavily, uh, you know, one upon the other. But you remember this because of um, what we we're talking about before with District Hall. I mean, when I first started working with my dad, I, I always tell the story as being, you know, we became entrepreneurs. And I know you, you dealt with entrepreneurs like this by virtue of necessity. It was a situation where, you know, my late mother, um, you know, like yourself, she was an incredible woman, an incredible force for change in the world. But, you know, when I graduated high school, she started getting really sick and her, you know, her complicated care progressed to a point where my dad had to quit work. He was working on Franklin Street, you know, here in Boston. And basically the decision was made that we were going to go all in on being patient advocates, but life goes on and you have to put bread on the table. So, I didn't have any business training. It's exactly like you said. I had none of that. I knew how to talk to people. I love to network. But the nuts and the bolts, which I think are so important to actually ensuring that small businesses are stood up and then succeed and thrive. I was in search of critical resources, yes, and, and knowledge. But I was also fundamentally in search of the other thing that you brought up just now, which is, well, two things, really, connection and community. So I found that, thankfully, in what would become Innovation Studio, because not only did I have access to the space, I had access to you, all of the other, you know, uh, staff, mentors, and I slowly began to realize that, you know what, me and my dad could do this, and we did do it. You know, we had a relatively successful go of it. Unfortunately, my mom passed away, which then prompted my dad, understandably, to be like, okay, that part of our life is now over, and that led to me becoming more... Um, independent and invested in the, the startup community. But I will never forget, I'm just going to close with this and then we'll get to the other question. I'll never forget when I first met you and when I first met everybody at District Hall, there was this one moment when I was working there and it was actually Dan Vadano who came by and he said, Steve, 
you're doing a great job. And I know him and Kevin did this and you did this all the time. Like you would just like make the rounds, just make the rounds and go up to people and say, Hey, what are you working on? Hey, what are you doing? Um, looks good. And, you know, Dan said to me, you're one of the bright lights in our community. Keep going. And he did this with a lot of other entrepreneurs too. And I, I know that to, you know, when you're in the weeds, when you're working on something, that little encouragement really goes a long way. And I also want to give you a chance to, to add anything onto that as well. Yeah. I was just going to, I was just going to post in the message, hashtag be human, Um, you know, community and being human and, and, and being authentic and, and truly caring about each other. Um, I think, you know, Jordan and I were just talking yesterday or the day before about in a lot of the programs that we're standing up and running, um, a critical component is that concierge, that, that, that person within the program that knows you and knows your story and checks in with you and says, Hey, Steve, like, how's it going? Like, are you getting a lot out of this program? Sorry, I keep crying because I'm, I'm watery. And, uh, you know, this all means something, right? Um, but, so my friend. <laughs> and, you know, and, and it's all about relationships, right? Life is about relationships. And, and we're still here for you, right? So Amy loves you, and you know with Jordan, we're we're a team, and we're it's like a family, it's a community. So here, here, and yeah, yeah. Um, together after all this time. I mean, because and I know a lot of people. I do talk about this from time to time. Like recently, for example, I I um, became a mentor with Share um, with the Share program, and I, I was talking about of all things, like you know, putting together your your perfect pitch deck. But I, I had to take a moment, too, because what happened was Jordan introduced me to all these entrepreneurs and what a range of experiences and what a diverse group of folks. And the one thing that united them, which was so great to see, was they were all hungry to learn and they were all hungry to to grow, really. I mean, they were coming at this from many, many, many different angles, many different points of the compass. and. They were all looking to, you know, succeed. And when I was done, there was this one entrepreneur who said to me, you know, in the way she said it, she it was a very simple sentence, but it's the way she said it that really hit me. She's like, thank you for being here and giving, giving your time to us. I mean, so simple, but I could, I could hear and feel like the emotion behind that and the sense of like gratitude and appreciation. And I feel like if we're going to continue to see more um, innovation, more success, more, you know, material prosperity, all that, of course, you know, shoot for the moon. But we also need to, and I think you do an excellent job of this, like take care of your people, check in with your people. And if I may, I'll, I'll end with this before we get to the next question. You, you touched on something that I don't want us to overlook, which is mental health. So what I tell our founders that I work with at Boston New Technology and Prepare for VC is like, you have to take time for yourself. Like we got the weekend coming up, for example, and you have to make that investment in yourself, not just in like the processes of business, not just in the different business operations, but I mean, you have to, and again, I think back to my earliest days at this recall, people walking around, like if somebody saw that I hadn't, you know, gotten something to drink or eat, they would remind me. They would, I mean, and these are the, this, this community treasures, like somebody who works at a, at a space coming up to the people and saying, um, you know, you've been here for a bit. Do you want to like get a coffee? Do you want to buy, buy a sandwich or something like, cause you see that people are like intensely focused on their work and you don't want to have them burn out. Yeah, basically. Yeah. So I just um, put in the chat, let's talk about the importance of self-awareness, which is critical. Um, uh, when I speak to, you know, kids of all ages, middle school, high school, college, or adults, I, I almost always bring up self-awareness and the importance of critical self-awareness. Um, I'm still learning, right? But I feel like for decades, if I had more clarity around my myself, what was negotiable, what's non-negotiable, what I need um, to operate at my best, you know, personally and professionally. I just think that we don't talk about that enough as a culture. And that's a critical, critical component of mental health too. Um, And then learning how to self-advocate and communicate effectively. Right now, um, you know, I have a friend that I actually um, mentor and advise that I have doing a program at 
the hive next month on um, nonviolent communication and deep listening. And I think those are just so important right now. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, it's, it all ties back to community, watching out for each other, being human together. We are stronger is a hashtag I've been using for forever since the beginning of hashtags. And, um, and, and again, I talk about the importance of self-awareness and to your point, you know, uh, we need, we need to self-regulate. Um, I had recently had Coral Brown do, that's Morty, um, do a session at the hive on, um, burnout, self-regulate nervous system health and self-regulation. And three, it was a great diverse audience that came to that. It was fantastic. And my biggest takeaway were three questions and I use it a lot in my coaching and mentoring and advising is how do I feel? What do I need? What am I going to do about it? And I use that a lot in my business coaching because so many of the solopreneurs or small business owners that I work with, they're so connected to their business. And I'll say, let's take a step back. Like, how do you feel right now? All right. Like, what do you need? And what are you going to do about it? What can we do about that? You know? So yeah, I could go on and on about this because I think it's critical. And I did study psychology and English, which I use, use in my business work all the time. Well, it's very, it's very important. It's really important. And I think that people don't sometimes ascribe the necessary amount of importance to it, even like when we treat, you know, the subject of failure in business, failure in entrepreneurship. I mean, now that I'm 35, I'm, you know, looking at the way things have been in my venture career. And in the past, I used to not want to talk about like, for example, the meetup group that I inherited that went absolutely nowhere. And that actually led to a bout of depression. But, you know, interesting thing about that too, when the dust settled after that experience, I, of course, went back to my familiar places and my people who care for me, you know, and the people, you know, Innovation Studio were like, hey, Steve, so great to have you back. So glad you're doing better, you know, and that was really, really reassuring. But when it comes to like failure in startups, to, I think we often, I want to get your thoughts on this specifically. I think we make it a lot about the numbers in terms mm -hmm. of like, did you know, I'm sure you've, I'm sure, you know, you hear this in your sleep. Did you know that over 99% of startups fail? Like we get that very abstract declaration, but we don't really see the human, the human cost, but also like the very real effects, the ripple effects that it have on, that it has rather on people because they often, as you know, fail to decouple, understandably, they fail to decouple themselves from what they do and it becomes very much wrapped up in identity like for example like when that meetup group of mine went nowhere i assumed because you know I, and i don't blame myself i'm gentle with myself i assumed well that must be because i'm an idiot and i have no idea what i'm doing and of course it's has nothing to do with that i mean yeah do you see this a lot both in your like your coaching work but also like overall with people with that kind of like meshing together of like business and self yeah, I, I think so. I mean, the Rhode Island VMS program, when we first stood that up, we were all aligned in knowing that our purpose with that program was to strengthen the entrepreneurial community in Rhode Island, not measure it on startup success, but measure it on, you know, so we went back and forth for years on how to measure success because there's a lot of, you know, um, tracking, you know, what's working and what isn't. Um, so as we would create surveys and whatnot, we, we talked a lot about, you know, what are we tracking and when, what is impact and how do we measure it and things like that. So um, I think, you know, I, I go back to being human and strengthening the individuals and being really clear about our why when we're launching something and, and you know, what are our goals. So it's definitely, I, I don't, I don't see it as much, um, I don't know why. I, I guess I, I I see a whole person, not just the business success or failure. So yeah, that definitely has something to do with it. But I think we've been focused on focusing on the individuals and strengthening the entrepreneurs with all this programming that we've been doing. So, but it is important. It is critical. I think, um, by, I think by merit of the fact that you're adopting an approach, that's probably why it's not coming up as much. I would say that in the wild, when entrepreneurs are not receiving that kind of critical support because they're isolated. That's another thing that you and I are concerned about. Obviously when you're isolated, when you're siloed, 
you're not going to get that mentorship. You're not going to get that awareness. You're not going to get that reality check. And so you'll begin, everything will begin to conflate. And slowly what I've seen with my work with entrepreneurs is again, if something goes wrong, it's not just, well, this is a part of the business that went wrong. It's I am wrong. There's something wrong with me. And I would say that this is especially prevalent in those that are like super new and, but not always. I mean, I've also dealt with entrepreneurs that have had multiple successes. And I guess, you know, the other side of that coin is if you had some success and then all of a sudden something goes wrong, it's, it causes a kind of freak, like what, like how did that transpire? And I think, like you said, it all goes back to community because if you're part of a community that's there for you, that supports you, that holds you close, then it doesn't really matter what happens because you won't be alone. And I really and truly feel like nobody should be in that situation when we always talk about resources. We always talk about, we have all of these unfair advantages as like the New England ecosystem. And, you know, I I think that we need to, like you said, always go back to the why, the purpose, the people. Um, But I want to get into the hive. The reason why I want to get into that is because, and as you know, I'm going to make it a point to visit you and explore the hive. And what I was actually thinking of doing, we'll see if we can make this happen, is we can have like a second talk over there, or at the very least, I can dust off my writing chops, which I know you used to love, and I can actually write something nice about it. But yeah, tell tell us more about like how the hive came to be and what it's all about, basically. Yeah, so we're in our 10th year and um, the hive is a magical place. It's I, I, I often refer to it as when you step into it, um, it's like stepping into your eclectic aunt's living room. Um, so if you just take a moment to think of that visual, what would my eclectic aunt's living room look like? It's kind of cozy. It's eclectic. Um, we When we started the hive, my friend Mike Baker, who's owned the historic mill you know, the Rodman Manufacturing Company was the original mill complex. He's owned it since the 80s um, in different iterations. And when he bought it, it was quite raw. Uh, it had been a manufacturing company. It had been a lumber yard. There was a train that had gone through it. Um, and he's made it more and more commercial over the decades. So um, when I joined him, he was a couple of years out from lo- losing a huge anchor tenant, the Department of Children and Young Families, so Rhode Island, DCYF. And they had been there for 18 years, I think. Um, And his background, you know, his undergrad in accounting, went to law school, became a pretty traditional developer in the 80s, 90s, 2000s. And with the mill, you know, he he's pretty conservative. So he had large anchor tenants and a lot less smaller tenants. And that was great, right? Um, because you have those core anchor tenants that you know you can count on for revenue. But when you lose the anchor tenants, it's harder to fill the larger spaces. And this was, you know, ten years ago, so we were still recovering from the two thousand eight recession. And um, I, it's funny, I've always been in love with the mill and the space that the hive is in used to be my insurance company, like in my early, in my twenties and early thirties. And I remember, um, I, I often think I manifest things. So I'm a little witchy in that way. Um, I remember being in there and I guess it was the nineties, must've been the nineties and having a feeling like I'm going to be here someday. Like it's really beautiful, you know? Um, and what had happened with the mill and how the hive came about is my friend, Larry Zevon, best WordPress developer ever, um, you know, my age. So he started out building websites for the Navy and, you know, he's one of those unique people who can like write code. He's very design savvy. He's an SEO, but he only focuses on customized WordPress sites. So um, we, he had his own business and he was working out of his home office and clients offices. I was working out of, Actually, the old NoCo name, North Coffee, was Updike's Newtown Coffee. Um, Mark, the previous owner, used to um, yell at me for getting mail there sometimes. Um, and Larry was the first to jump and take an office. So he took an office in our Shewatuck building. And I was meeting with him about a client project. And we took a walk around. And it was like a ghost town. So um, we now have five of the original buildings. Back then, Mike had four of the original buildings, 72,000 square feet. And the main building, the Rodman building, um, 16,000 square feet per floor. 
it was literally like a ghost town, like, hello, hello, hello. And, um, and, uh, Larry and I were walking through there. And at that time, Beta Spring existed in Providence. It was like the state's first incubator space, I believe. And it was partially subsidized by the state and there was stuff going on there. And Larry and I, unlike, and you know a little bit about Rhode Island, Steve, um, people get stuck in their space places in Rhode Island. So we call Warwick, which is the middle of the state, the, the Warwick Dixon line. And a lot of people from Southern Rhode Island, it depends where you are in Southern Rhode Island. They don't even go past the tower, which is on route one near URI. Um, but a lot of people in Southern Rhode Island don't go past Warwick. A lot of people in Providence Metro don't go past Providence. It's really funny. So Larry and I had been going up to Beta Spring and pitch events and things like that. And Larry's from New York originally, um, moved here in the late eighties, I think, and worked for the Navy in Newport and whatnot. So then married a Rhode Islander. So we were like, you know, walking around, like, wouldn't it be cool? And I had been like, I love URI, went to URI, was trying to get URI more involved with the private sector and build some kind of entrepreneurial thing there. So it's like, wouldn't this be cool if we created like an incubator here and we connected URI more with it and that connected to Providence and, and, you know, we're just talking and whatnot. And Mike, who owned the mill was at a point where it was like, I don't care what you do because I'm underwater right now and I need to figure out how to get out. So I kind of set up shop in the hive. My kids used to skateboard and play basketball in the hive. So it's the old boiler room of the original ramen manufacturing company, really tall ceilings. It's where the uh, Corliss steam engine was. So concrete on the floors under like the carpeting and there was no furniture or anything in there. And I brought my grandmother's shaker pine table and I figured out where I could suck off the Wi-Fi that Mike had. And I would work there and just invite people to come and tour and say, this is what we're thinking. What do you think? And, um, and everyone from like Senator Whitehouse's team, because we have, we have like a little waterfall um, from, that's connected to the original dye house. And I was really into renewable energy technology back then. And I wanted to do hydro and a green roof and solar. And I would bring, you know, the office of energy people and the Senator Whitehouse's team. And Jessica David was at the Rhode Island foundation back then and her and, people from um, uh, Rhode Island Small Business Journal and like just bring people in and we give them a tour. I would give them a tour and say, this is what we're thinking. What do you think? And um, where at first we thought incubator program and Larry's wife, who's a graphic designer um, at Bryant said, what about the boiler room? Because it's the old boiler room and, you know, boiler room incubator. I said, I don't know, it just feels a little negative. And then the more I gave tours and the more time I spent physically in the space, I said, you know what, we're, we're Southern Rhode Island, like Larry surfs. If the waves are good, he's got a surfboard on his, on his uh, vehicle. You know, I love to swim at high tide. So if it's summertime, I might have flip-flops on and a bathing suit under nice, my nice. dress. So um, I said, I think it's a co-working space. So what we did was just started sourcing random furniture and inviting some people to come co-work alone together with us and give it a try. And Larry built the website and, um, that first summer, that was the spring of 2013. That first summer, we did a super soft opening. Like we made a le website live and um, we had a woman come from South Carolina who worked for a big nonprofit. Um, and she was used to working in co-working spaces and found us online and came and worked. And she was a great, like she gave us great feedback. And we just kind of learned and evolved and just kept, I kept sourcing used furniture and rugs and things. And, um, and the hive was born. So that oh. is <laughs> an important part of that. Please, please. So I'm a growth strategist. This is, I help businesses grow. And yeah. I, I think I said Mike was 42-ish percent occupancy, 72,000 mm -hmm. square feet. So I very strategically, like, so Larry and I co-founded the hive and with Mike, because he let us do it. And um, I very strategically used it as a guerrilla marketing vehicle that drove a very strategic redevelopment and rebranding of the mill into what it is now. So we went from 40 something percent, 72,000 square feet. We're at 85,000 square feet. Mike bought back another building during the pandemic. Um, so we're up to five of the original buildings and we're at pretty much 100% occupancy. And that was using guerrilla marketing and using the hive as the, the guerrilla marketing vehicle that drove the redevelopment and rebranding. Um, uh, 2015, 16, probably 16, we built millatlafayette.com website 
continue to iterate and grow. Um, so it's very much been the marketing vehicle for the mill complex and continues to be what I call the nucleus of it. So now that we've built out over a hundred smaller spaces versus having, you know, a handful of large anchor tenants and some small, we have over a hundred tenants now. And, um, because they have smaller spaces, they don't all have, you know, break rooms and whatnot. So the hive is available to any of our, I call them community members, not tenants. And, um, you know, we have Ryan who does, he's in MarTech and um, does a lot of automated emails, mostly in the med tech space. He comes down almost every day for lunch. I love it. Sometimes his wife joins him. Um, I was talking to his son the other day who was having grilled cheese and tomato on FaceTime and it's very community based. Um, and we, until the pandemic, um, you know, Mike and I would offer it to nonprofits at no cost to have their board meetings or Mike was president of the board of the Brain Injury Fund of Rhode Island. So they used to have like a support group that met once a, once a month. And um, it's really, we really made it a community space. And I've, I've run an art gallery, a community-based art gallery out of there since we opened. So probably hosted ugh, close to a hundred art openings and have had, you know, hundreds and hundreds of people attend those. And we've supported everything from, you know, first time kind of artists, art show to professional international artists. So I guess that's more about the hive. Yeah. And so first of all, that was an absolutely beautiful and breathtaking journey from the ground up. One of the things that stood out to me the most is when you, when you combine purpose, like a strong sense of purpose with those strategic skills, I mean, look at what you can create. Look at what look at what kind of transformation can take place. It brings me back. You want to talk about eclectic? I had a very eclectic uh, thought about when I was a little boy. I often tell the story of watching the movie Metropolis, which was made back in like the early 1920s with with my dad. You know, Fritz Lang. Uh, ultimately, Fritz and all of his people had to flee to Nazis. It was like this whole thing, but. And a lot of the movie of Metropolis was lost to the ravages of the Second World War. But um, there's a message, there's an underlying message there that I think you'll resonate with, but also I feel like it's very important for all of us to think about who work and live in this space, which is that the mediator between the head and the hands has to be the heart. And that's like the main, the main thrust of the, of the film. When I listen to you take us through how the hive was born, that just kept coming to me again and again and again. On the one hand, there's a lot of hard work. There's a lot of grit. There's a lot of intelligent application of, okay, we're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to make this step and you know crush this goal. But at the same time, there is, again, that why. It's like, well, why are we doing all this? And the fact that you use the word eclectic, I think that when you take that eclectic approach, what you end up doing, I think in your case, is a conscious thing that you do, but it's sometimes unconscious on the part of things that just happen in a wonderful way. That eclecticism, if you will, creates a very vibrant culture because, you know, if you think about the hive, you have artists, you have nonprofits, you have entrepreneurs of all shapes and sizes. Everybody's like mixing together. And I want to end with this and get your thoughts on this particular subject. I think that the model that you've pursued should be one that we look at more when it comes to co-working, as opposed to the dark side of co-working. Obviously, when we've seen what happens when you just have a corporation, for example, that wants to put as many butt butts in seats as possible, and they really don't care about, say, how people are doing or what they're working on. It's like, okay, you filled out your membership, you get three months of this place, uh, you know, hustle and grind. I mean, I think that is the fundamental difference. Correct me if I'm wrong between a place like the hive and any other thing that you might get a random advertisement for. No. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah, it's so remember when I said, you know, I signed up to get innovate Newport open and build the initial community and culture. Yes. Um, community and culture is key. And, and part of the magic of the hive is um, I call it a community-based economy. And that diversity is critical. Um, diversity of thought, diversity of backgrounds, diversity of kinds of businesses. We have two architects, interior designer, um, 
chiropractors, uh, physical therapists. We have a, a whole handful of massage uh, therapists that are fantastic because we need that body work. We have a ton of mental health uh, workers. So we have psychologists, anxiety disorder specialists to social workers. And, you know, I think we have like over a dozen ten, uh, community members that are mental health specialists. And then we have um, Jamu, which makes a <laughs> uh, 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 a, t- a chai mix, a ginger turmeric time, chai mixture. Um, and so, so many different kinds of businesses. So I, I do agree that diversity is critical and um, special. And I very consciously think of the hive and the mill as an organism that I just kind of just support like a garden, right? It's where does it need more water or more sun? You know, where, where do we need to move things around and clear things out so it gets what it needs? Um, where does it need a little um, organic fertilizer? And where is it fine on its own to just let it do its thing? So, you know, it's it has to do just similar to the work I'm doing in Bridgewater, Mass. Um, you know, the stars are aligned there. For over a decade, um, the people of Bridgewater have been thoughtfully creating a a master plan and they've signed off on it. And now they have a town council leadership and leadership team, the town manager, the assistant town manager. And they brought in my friend Bob to head up community and economic development office to lead the execution of the redevelopment strategy. That's part of their very thoughtfully planned out master plan. It's, it's because there's alignment and, and, with, you know, it, it's a great team to execute something like that, you know, at the mill, at the hive in the mill, you know, we're a good team and we're aligned in kind of that, that cultural energy. And um, it, it's just, it works. So it, it, it has to do with the culture um, and in the alignment of, of kind of values and strategy, I guess you could say. I don't know if that makes sense. It, it does. If you, especially if you appreciate it, as being like that, that triangulation of, of factors and something that I failed to do at the top of our conversation, which I'm going to make up for now and also add some insight onto is, you know, ECOS. So we're using ECOS.ai. I came to it as a result of an article that uh, was written with another one of the community managers here in Boston being spotlighted. And, you know, you know me, I'm very curious. I decided to take this for a spin. So I met Melise. I met Melise Doral, who unfortunately can't be here because she and, and Buka are now part of the Techstars Boston cohort, which we're very happy about that. Um, but when I talked to Melise, it was that conversation, which was a very Tooney-like conversation, I should say, about how she sees community and ecosystem building. I mean, I have used, and I know you've used too, like hundreds of different, like, you know, community platforms, you know, small ones, big ones, et cetera. And what really stood out to me about Melissa's vision is that she wants to make it so that if you are that person who is new to a place, new to a space, you know, you can easily find people that you should be connecting with. And also it's all about building relationships and it's all very much an organism as opposed to just like this static entity that almost be like you enter into it and you said like, you know, ghost town. Exactly. Like you get crickets and cobwebs and all of that. So what I've been noticing and I'm very much encouraged by is like, there is more of this uh, cultural shift in our thinking in the startup world where we're not just, and I hate to, I I don't hate to be, I I mean, I've always been hundred percent with you. I'm just going to say it like it is. I feel like people that are just building funnels and tools are now being challenged by those who are true relationship builders and a little maverick in their thinking too, because, you know, they're not just thinking about making money. They're thinking about doing good to do well. And, you know, with that, um, I know we're going to be coming up on an hour and I don't want to impose on your time. I have a really important question to end with, which is for those, you know, out there who are listening, who have, uh, you know, no doubt been inspired by all this. And, you know, maybe they're thinking, I want to do the kinds of things that, Tooney has done, or I want to do my own thing. I just don't know how. What kind of advice would you give to those, uh, shall we say, like future trailblazers? Uh, Well, I would say um, find mentors, uh, find advisors, find your tribe, 
uh, find programs that can, that can help you. Um, and try to stay with a growth mindset, try to stay open, just try to be coachable. Um, that's, that's critical. Um, and I, I, and in finding your tribe, or if you're looking for something similar, I, I meant to shout out at, in the previous answer, um, Sarah Travers work bar. I think they're doing a great job at a higher level. And the other Sarah, um, for, um, groundwork that started in New Bedford and she's expanded to fall river. Um, those are heart-based, uh, human centered, uh, co-working businesses. The hive is a little different, um, because I don't need to generate the revenue that a straight up co-working business needs to generate. The hive is the nucleus of an 85,000 square foot mill community. Um, so it's a, it's a different model. We're basically the marketing arm of Bigford Properties LLC. So it's, it's very different. Um, so, you know, co-working businesses uh, are hard to, you know, it, it's not, it's not an easy business model, but a couple that I think are doing really well are the two Sarahs. <laughs> so um, awesome. yeah, find your tribe. Yeah. That, I mean, that I would also say the same thing to the audience in the sense that when again going back to the very beginning when me and my dad became entrepreneurs we had to find our tribe because if you are out there hunting and foraging for yourselves in this very you know sometimes harsh but always uncertain always unpredictable landscape you're going to need help and it's okay to ask for and receive that help and you'll also make some very valuable friendships along the way like yours and mine so how can people stay in touch with Tooney? Uh, LinkedIn. I love LinkedIn. Uh, so please, um, pretty easy, Tooney Shartner, T-U-N-I-S-C-H-A-R-T-N-E-R. That's also my Gmail, Tooney Shartner at Gmail. So you can email me. Um, Tooney, uh, TS Strategies, TS Consulting on Facebook, a little marketing faux pas, Tooney underscore Shartner underscore Consulting on Instagram. Nice. Um, but I'm most active on LinkedIn. And uh visit the hive <laughs> i know i will um, I and hope. and and rhode island startup week is is next week official kickoff today yes. but I'll be, I'll be at innovate newport monday and friday i'll be at venture cafe providence on thursday um we have amy and the small business showcase at westway uh through innovation studio on thursday i mean wednesday sorry so there's a lot going on there is yeah thank well, you Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And again, I'm so glad you anticipated uh, me wanting to shout out, uh, you know, Rhode, Rhode Island Startup Week, especially like Westway, Greg Stapleton. I mean, there's so many people that we've interviewed, too, who are going to be, you know, leading Luminary. So, oh, great. Well, we're seeing yes. that. Hi, Janice. Janice is so awesome. She's been part She's of part the of my Boston tribe. Week. And yep. mine, too. Yeah, Boston <laughs> Technology. Right. So, everybody, again, thanks again for joining us. Uh, this will be up on our YouTube soon. But, Tooney, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you.